again and again, I found myself, uh, as I was going, you know, writing more and more people saying this thing to me that I was never telling about what an alternative society would look like. And uh, so I thought, okay, uh, I'll sit down and, and write a kind of a, almost a novelistic sketch of what this alternative uh, world would look like. Uh, my publisher friend was horrified. <laughs> he thought this was a terrible thing to do. Uh, he thought uh, I should not publish it. Um, but I was writing this book called Spaces of Hope, uh, which was about uh, some of the things that were happening right now in urbanization, particularly in the United States, uh, but then also moving to say, well, what are the alternatives and thinking about utopias. And so I decided uh, to write this kind of uh, dreamlike uh, world uh, piece at the end of it, which was... Uh, uh, about uh, a, a different a different world, and I called it uh, uh, Idyllia. Um, I'm never quite sure why I did. It just came to me one day. Uh, seemed to me like a, a, a good a good title, and it's uh, it's based on a, a sort of partly a, a practical scenario as to how a revolutionary movement might actually come in come into being that would change the world. Uh, but then uh, what it does is to sort of talk about the world that, that emerged uh, out of that uh, uh, revolutionary, out of that revolutionary movement. Um, it was a, a sketch, uh, and there were, but there are two things uh, that were important to me in, in doing it. First, uh, many of the ideas in there were those which can be found in other utopian schemas, so it was not as if uh, I was inventing it entirely on my own. I was drawing upon uh, many of the, the past uh, uh, utopian schemas. But the second thing that was terribly important to me was that there was nothing really being described in there that was not already in existence. And one of the things that it seems to me about uh, conventional utopias is they very often fantasize a world that is not based on any reality. But most of the technologies and most of the, the, the possibilities which are described there uh, already exist uh, around us and, and uh, it's just that people are uh, not uh, seeing them and it was very interesting that uh, in 2000 when it was published uh, some people kind of said this is kind of crazy but now we see all of these things going along like uh, biometric, uh, organ, you know, um, identification methods and so on, which uh, I, I had introduced there, which I knew were there at the time, uh, but are now becoming actually quite uh, commonplace. So to me it was a very uh, interesting exercise. It had, however, a very interesting <laughs> sort of impact. Uh, in the English-speaking world, hardly anybody ever refers to it. Nobody wants to talk about it. They ignore it entirely. And, but it was very fascinating to me when I was uh, in Chile about six years ago. I suddenly found uh, everybody had read it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I had a, a, a Brazilian friend uh, who came to study for a year in uh, New York who kind of said, oh, we use it all the time. So obviously this, it appeals to people in some parts of the world, but uh, in the English-speaking world, uh, I guess everybody felt like my publisher. It was the sort of thing, you ought not, it was too embarrassing to, to really publish it. Uh, the idea uh, of political uh, organization is it has to recognize something which is terribly important to, to me as a geographer, which is the question of scale the scale at which decisions are made and the scale at which thinking takes place. Um, there is a great fascination on the left right now with very local forms of organization. I sympathize with that and I think that that should be the basis of any alternative form which should be small local uh, organizations, uh, democratically structured um, and uh, horizontally constructed. But uh, there is a, a problem when you start to think about how uh, the forms of organization 
of that sort? How do they run a whole big city like Sao Paulo or Buenos Aires or wherever? Uh, and uh, those forms of organization really don't seem able to be able to, to really grasp something as large as a, as, a, as a contemporary metropolitan city, in which case you're either forced to the idea where we're going to dismantle Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo and New York City and all go and live in these small little things, which I think would be a, a, both an environmental disaster, a social disaster and a political disaster. Or you say, all right, well, if all of these local bases uh, things are there, then we have to find some way of scaling up political organizations so that representatives from these different small groups come together in regional assemblies and make decisions about regional, uh, I would prefer bio-regional kind of configurations which, or metropolitan regional organizations. And then the metropolitan regional organizations have to make decisions, have to come together uh, at a national level. And then there are certain global questions uh, like, for example, uh, is there going to be a global money and are, are there going to be global forms of exchange? Are there going to be global forms of the division of labor and, and, and what are they going to look like and, and, and how are global agreements going to be struck? So it seemed to me terribly important to, uh, in, divide, in thinking about an alternative form of society uh, to have uh, different forms of political representation at different scales which were given different powers always with the idea that this was not going to be a top-down structure that if, if everything should somehow or other uh, be, be based in, 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 in the, the small local kind of forms of society um, but then I also wanted those for local forms of society not to be repressive one of the difficulties of, of, of having kind of uh, localities is that they can sometimes be very repressive. I've lived in, in local communities that are extremely repressive. And so you want to, the max, to maximize choice uh, so that people can move from one community situation to another to say, look, I, I don't like living in this particular community. Uh, I want to go and join a group over here that's different and, 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 and that way you can maximize different and people can have choice. Uh, and, and so we, we, I tried to imagine a situation where maybe once a year or something like that there would be a situation where instead of it being chaotic you would, you would, you would sort of sign on to be on a, in a community or not be in a community and that would last for a year and at the end of the year you could say well okay I'm going to go to another one and live somewhere else. And I also very much like the idea uh, of what I have right now, which is a sabbatical. I think everybody, uh, should, there should be a universal right to a sabbatical. Once every seven years, you should go off and do anything you like somewhere else. And not, not, not working. I mean, you know, doing something different. Going and living in a community which is doing something very different. Uh, and, and, and learning about it, and that's where the geographer comes in, like, you know, well, what would it like to sort of uh, be a rice farmer in, uh, in Thailand, or what would it be like uh, to, uh, to work the land in Argentina? So here I am on my, on my sabbatical, and I'm spending a lot of time digging the garden, working the land, and doing things of that sort, and I think everybody should have a right to do that. I think there always has to be a, a scientific and technological foundation to, to any kind of social order. Uh, but we have to be very careful about imagining that science and technology are neutral. Uh, they are not. Many of the technologies we have with us right now are technologies which are very, very closely connected to capitalist forms of, cor of corporate control. And so it's very difficult to adopt the technology without actually ending up adopting the forms of corporate control. So we have to be very careful about, about that. And Marx, I think, was very explicit about this, kind of saying that capital, as it developed, had to define its own technological and organizational basis, uh, which was unique to it. Uh, which is very different from the technology and organizational form of feudalism or any other preceding kind of society. So an alternative society has to look to the technological wizardry that has been delivered to us by the history of capital. There's no question that it's there and we've got to make use of it. But then it has also to ask the question, what would be the technological basis uh, for uh, an alternative kind of society? 
And to me, again, in the idyllia kind of thing, I wanted very much to say, um, one of the questions that we have to look at is what kinds of technologies should we develop? There should be uh, technologies which lighten the load of labor. And, and Marx made this wonderful kind of statement. He said, you know, we are always told that technologies lighten the load of labor, but actually a lot of the technologies which have invented under capitalism have been about repressing labor, alienating labor even further from the production process by incorporating intelligence inside of the machine rather than allowing human intelligence uh, to predominate. So we have to rethink uh, the technological technological basis and I wanted to say to everybody yes look we have tremendous possibilities uh, with with the technologies we've inherited but we need uh, to think about how to reconfigure them around a different idea of social relations a different idea of our relations to nature a different idea of, of production systems one of the things that's happened with science and technology uh, is that science and technology became a business in its own right. Um, and it, it, it did that a little bit during the 19th century. And one of the things that came out of this was the research university. The research universities, I think, uh, over the last hundred years have done a fantastic job because early on the idea was that, that innovation flourished best when people were left to do it on their own that human curiosity would lead them to do certain things. So there was a, a curious relationship between uh, corporate power and the universities, in which universities had a certain autonomy and independence. But what we've seen over the last 30 years is an increasing subservience of the universities uh, to corporate power, so that now corporations actually claim the right, in some instances, to dominate research labs, to make appointments, uh, to actually capture uh, the innovations which have been made. And uh, there was a time when, when innovations were patented in the public interest, and now they are patented increasingly for private gain. So you see, if you like, the creation of the neoliberal university over the last 30 years, which is, uh, very interestingly, is nowhere near as innovative uh, as, as, as it used to be, because there is not the freedom within it uh, to go off and do kinds of crazy things and, 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 you know, sometimes things that work and sometimes things that don't work. It's more and more orchestrated around a corporate agenda uh, or around the military agenda. Um, but like I say, there always was a moment of the part of the university that was around that, but the university as a whole was not about that, but now it's increasingly become more and more about that, with, of course, a lot of government pressure uh, to be like that. Now, for example, in Britain, if you apply for public money uh, to do research, one of the things you have to do in your application is to explain how this is going to be useful uh, to uh, make Britain more competitive and make corporations more competitive. I find electro electronic banking fascinating. I mean, when you think about it, you just go and you put your card in a machine and money comes out. And you say to yourself, well, you know, why, why couldn't everybody in the world be given a card and given a, a certain base income and they can just go into a machine and put, put the card in and take money out and, and, and use it as they want. So that you would imagine that all the money in the world was something which was representing all of that which has been collectively produced. And there it is in the banks. And we all have an equal share in it because we're all shareholders in the global economy. And so we all get our aliquot part of it and we just take our card and put it in and take out what we, what we need. I mean, wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a wonderful society uh, that way? And of course, um, after about three weeks of a month, we find we might run out of money, in which case, uh, too bad. But we have to you get used to, you know, sort of spending what, whatever comes out of the, the, the machine. Then, you know, you, you have the money and you can spend it. Um, and, and you have the points and you have the, 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 the chips. Now, you, you may save some of them, that's 
to be to be sure. But it may be that if you think of putting money in on the first of the month, you could say you've got to spend it in the month, and after a month, it's gone. Uh, and it disappears so that people cannot save. That would be one of the ways to prevent uh, accumulation. So that you say, all right, you have a monthly allowance, but you've got to spend it in the month. And if you haven't spent it by the end of the month, it disappears. There's always a role, there is now, there's always a role for a market in society. I think uh, since human societies began, there's been trading of some kind. That, that, the, the, that I have this and you have that and I want that and you want this, so we simply trade. And, and uh, we can barter or we can, you know, and there are lots of markets around right now. For instance, uh, uh, I don't know whether you, have, whether you have these here in Argentina, uh, but there are these markets where people take their cars and the back of their cars, they have a bunch of things that they, they think they might want to trade. Uh, so uh, somebody has a silver pot and somebody else has something else and so people just go around and, and trade. There will always be a space for markets and there always should be a space for markets. Uh, the big question uh, is could you have, can you organize markets in such a way that people can't accumulate great, we great wealth and power out of those, those market exchanges? Uh, and uh, that seems to me to be a trickier kind of kind of, kind of question. Um, and of course, there were pre-capitalist societies where, if you became extremely wealthy, there came a point where you were supposed to give it all away, or in some cases even just burn it, you know, or something of that kind. So, so there were sanctions against the accumulation of uh, vast amounts of wealth. So, I think we have to think about. Uh, how, how to prevent uh, that happening, but I'm certainly not uh, against... I, I love markets. Uh, and and, and uh, actually, uh, it's, it's very interesting, my, my, my mother-in-law, when she goes around, uh, you think she's, she's going to shop, but she's not really going to shop, she's going to have a conversation. It's impossible to get her out of a shop because she gets involved in such deep conversations. I mean, it's, it's a moment of intense sociality. Uh, and, and so I think uh, traditional markets of that sort and even haggling and, 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 and bargaining and, and, and so on are, are enjoyable pastimes. So markets are fun and, and um, I, I love some of those. Uh, in Baltimore we used to have one of these big covered markets, you know, and there were fish stalls and there were everything else. And, I think uh, those are wonderful places to be and, and, and uh, so I would never want to see them go away.